one of the things that I love about preaching is that there are times that I look at a familiar passage and I'm struck by some things that I hadn't really noticed before. And um, we're going to pray later in the service again. Um, but I want us to dig into this passage of Scripture. And then we'll pray later, I think, with a little bit different perspective. This is Exodus chapter 32. I'm going to start at verse 1 and read through verse 24, and we will refer to some later verses, but that's what I'm going to read right now. Hear these words, and if you've heard them before, don't let them become fami too familiar. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, side note, he's been up there for 40 days. They had come to the mountain of God and they kind of felt like something was happening. And Moses has gone up there. Yeah. They gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make up gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt... We don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterwards they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Then the Lord said to Moses, again, still up on the mountain, Go down, because your people, whom you brought up out of Egypt, have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so my anger may burn against them, that I may destroy them. Then I will make you a great nation. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord his God. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger, relent, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land. I promise them, and it will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented and did not bring his, on his people the disaster he had threatened. Moses turned and went down the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands. They were inscribed on both sides, front and back. The tablets were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. 
when Joshua heard the noise of the people shouting, he said to Moses, there is the sound of war in the camp. Moses replied, it is not the sound of victory. It is not the sound of defeat. It is the sound of singing that I hear. When Moses approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, his anger burned and he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. Then he took the calf the people had made and burned it in the fire. Then he ground it to powder scattered it on the water, and made the Israelites drink it. He said to Aaron, What did these people do to you that you led them into such great sin? Do not be angry, my lord, Aaron answered. You know how prone these people are to evil. They said to me, Make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. So I told them, whoever has any gold jewelry, take it off. Then they gave me the gold, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. This is the word of the Lord. Lord, teach us. Shape us. Shake us. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the fourth of five messages um, in a series that we're calling Still With Us. We've been talking about how just because Christmas is over and we don't still think about Emmanuel, God with us, that he is still with us. Jesus didn't leave because was over, but one of the things that happens over and over and over and over and over again in the Bible is that God is active, and then the next day or the next week or the next month or the next generation, God's people are like, where's God? God, at this point in Exodus 32, has been visited with them. I mean, think about it for the people of Israel. They had seen God do miracles to set them free to bring them out of Egypt. And when they were out of Egypt, God had sent a miracle and he had split the Red Sea. And then he had been visibly with them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. So they knew God was with them. And when they were hungry and thirsty, God sent water and God sent manna and quail. And God was obviously with them. And now they're saying, 40 days, where is he? But that's not an unfamiliar feeling, is it? I mean, we see it over and over and over again later in the Bible. The Old Testament ends with the prophet Malachi, and 400 years later, Jesus. I mean, think about that. 400 years later. It wasn't like, Oh, my grandma remembers when God was here. No. My great, 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 great grandmother saw God at work. Israel, is this, am I doing something? Am I? I don't know. It's not Levi's fault. So, um, if, again, I'll. Yep. Okay. Let's, uh, there we go. 400 years later, Jesus shows up. And the people are like, whoa, the... There's God, Emmanuel, with us. And then he's crucified. And for three days, the people 
the disciples, his followers, are saying, God has abandoned us. And then Jesus rises from the dead, and then he ascends to heaven. But before he leaves, he promises them, I will be with you to the very end of the age. And that promise is still functional, but tell me that there weren't times when the apostles, after Jesus went back, that there weren't times that Jesus' followers didn't turn to each other and say, remember when we could see him? Remember when he was right there? And for 2,000 years, that's where we've lived, right? This struggle to say, God is with us, we believe it. But there's an honest question, what about when God doesn't seem real? It happens, doesn't it? Let's look at this passage because this is a great instruction about what do we do when God is absent. And I almost, I didn't want to use the word absent because some of us are thinking, well, no, no, he's not absent. Come on, Pastor Mark. Yeah, but it feels that way, doesn't it? So we're going to see in this passage, well, I, as we dig into it, I want you to stop and imagine for a moment, first of all, that you were one of the people of Israel. And you had gen then for 40 days wondering where Moses was. I mean, there's, there's signs in the scripture earlier in Exodus that they could kind of hear the echo of God's voice. They knew that something was happening up on the mountain, but not in the camp. They knew that God was at work, but not in the camp. They knew that God was speaking and active and strong and powerful but on the mountain. Do you ever feel like God is absent or silent? Like he's speaking to other people. You hear stories, you hear testimonies, and you say, wow, God is doing incredible things somewhere else. Or you feel like God is really using people other than me. Or you feel like there was a time when God was at work, but it, it's not now. Maybe you look back a year, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years at your own life, and you say, I remember when God felt so real and so alive and I felt like I was being used by God and it was so amazing. I wish that was true now. You ever feel that way? Even as a church, this is our 175th anniversary this year of our church starting at First Reformed Church in Roseland, moving down here. And one of the most common things that we experience, let's be honest, is this sense of God used to do great things. Now, if you were reading this book and you'd been reading through Exodus, you'd kind of have a similar experience. You, you would have spent several chapters prior to this with God speaking. Most of Exodus prior to this is God talking to Moses. 
And so if you're reading the book of Exodus, when you come to the end of chapter 31, you have heard God speaking and alive and working and doing awesome stuff. And all of a sudden, it changes. I mean, God has just given these Ten Commandments, and they are breaking at least four of them right away. Um, there are, well, you know, you shall have no other gods before me. Huh? Okay, blew that one. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything. Uh, blew that one. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. And they say, this is God. Let's celebrate and worship this calf. And the ninth commandment says, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. And they're saying, this calf, that, this calf is what brought us out of Egypt. Really? That's not true. They know it. And so it's kind of a shocking moment. Now, I want to say one other thing before I continue. We all have a tendency to listen to sermons sometimes on behalf of other people. Right? Yeah. My husband needs to hear this. My, I, that guy that I work with, it, I wish he was here. My daughter, oh, this would be good for her. But I want to challenge you that this sermon is for you and for me, not for somebody else. Because every one of us, we do this. Well, let's walk through it. Okay. God is not behaving like they want him to. God is not doing things in the timing and the way and the, the kind of process that the people of Israel want. So they say, well, we'll just remake, it, remake the thing. And actually, if you read verse 1 there, it says, they gather around Aaron. That doesn't quite capture the sense of what's going on here. The, the word gathered around could actually be they, they came at him. It's not a friendly crowd. It's not people saying, hey, Aaron, hey, buddy, how you doing? Hey, we just had an idea. This is a crowd around him menacing and saying, Aaron, we know what, you want us to, what we want you to do. Now, that's not to excuse Aaron, but there's pressure. And Aaron says, oh, okay, um, bring your valuables, offer them up. Not offer them up to God, just bring them to me. And he says, um, they bring it and they took it off and they melted it down. And what's interesting here is that what they're bringing, those are good things, right? There's, this isn't a condemnation of jewelry. God is not anti-earring. That's not the point. But they're taking good things that came from God, Scripture is clear, and they're offering it up to somebody else. God, idols are usually good things that we make God things. Good things that we make God things. And they're doing what the culture around them says to do. They have just spent a long time in slavery in Egypt... Egypt is polytheistic, lots of gods, and the way that everybody around them functions, the way every nation other than Israel functions, is when you need a god, you make one. 
And so they're doing what the culture says is fine. And Aaron does what they ask, and he makes a golden calf. And what's interesting is they invest in this calf both their past and their future. Do you notice that? He says, they say together, this is, these are our gods. Also, actually, the, the number can be also translated, this is our God who brought us out of Egypt. They're taking everything that God has done and they're investing it in this golden calf. But they're also looking to him for hope. What they said in verse 1. Come make us gods who will go before us. We, we're gonna, we want a different God that we're going to give the credit for what's happened in the past. And that we're going to trust. We're going to place our trust in. So I want to ask you. We're talking at this point, if you're taking notes, about making idols. What I want to ask you is, what are your idols? An idol is really anything that we put in the place of God, that we trust in, that we place our hope in, that we thank for providing for us what we need. I made a list of some idols that <laughs> most of these I see in my own life. But this is just for us all to kind of get on the same page. Sometimes approval is an idol, right? Oh, if, if only this person will approve of me or this organization or if I could get this certificate or if I could be honored this way, I'd be fine. Or maybe comfort's an idol. I, you know what? I'm going to trust God as long as my life looks this way and kind of has a certain level of comfort and familiarity. And I'm going to be fine. Maybe power's an idol. I want to be in control of my life. I want to be in control of other people. Maybe stuff is an idol. I want a nicer car, a bigger home, nicer clothes. I, I don't know what you want. Maybe you want a nicer lawn, but it can become an idol. Achievement. If I can accomplish this, even if nobody else affirms it, if I know I did this, I'm going to feel good about that, and I will, my life will be okay. Anything that we trust to make our life okay, other than God, is an idol. And one of the problems that we see in this passage is that most of the time, nobody confronts our idols, right? Most churches, you know, there's, there's all kinds of stories about pastors that give vague messages and hope that that person who is struggling will get it. Nobody, most of the time, goes and looks somebody in the eye and says, you need to deal with this, don't you? And I'm not talking about pastors or elders or anybody, you know, kind of running around judging people. I'm talking about how often can we have something that is controlling our life, something that's taking our eyes off of God, and nobody has the courage to poke us in the idol. Most families don't do it. Well, I know that aunt somebody is like that, but don't say anything. It won't do any good. Because 
we get very defensive when somebody puts a finger there. Right? We are generally pretty comfortable poking minor things. But once it becomes an idol, if I'm, I'm not going to recommend Brooklyn Nine-Nine, the TV show. But there was a TV show, um, there was an episode of that show where two of the characters had mumps. And they had big old mump swell, swollen things. And they're quarantined together. And they start to get mad at each other. And they start to poke each other's mumps. And it's really, it's very funny. But I thought, how many of us have these things that are growing on us, that are spreading in our life, and the last thing we want anybody to do is to poke us in the idol. So why is this a problem? If they, I mean, they just made a calf, no big deal. Well, we see a couple things here. One is that God is offended because they're giving credit to somebody else for what he has done. Why is this a problem? It's also a problem because idols don't work, do they? Have you ever had a moment in your life when you're like, if I were to get this promotion, ah, life would be great. And then you get that promotion and you're like, well, if I can get that promotion, that promotion, that raise, that house, if I can live there, if I can get this girl to date me, if I can get, I mean, they don't work. I mean, try it. Whatever it is that you have thought about already in this message that is sometimes an idol for you, try praying to it. Just wondering how that's going to go for you. In fact, if anything, and I'm not suggesting you pray to your car. I'm just saying if you do, you're going to look stupid. Okay? So that's how an idol is made. So the step the second step that we see here is the breaking of the idols. How does an idol get confronted in our life? Number one, confront the idol. Now, the best one to do it is God. That's one of the reasons we need to be in God's word is that it pokes the idols. But there are often people who God uses. If we let them. Right? I want to ask you that question. Who in your life will poke you in the idol? Do they know that you need them to do that? If they don't know that that's their job, they won't do it. When I was working in the corporate world... One of the things that we talked about was the fact that, on one hand, job descriptions were completely useless because everybody knew what they were supposed to do and other people were doing all kinds of stuff. But on the other hand, if something isn't in someone's job description, no one does it. Who knows that their job description includes poke you in the idol. So how does this happen? In this passage, um, Moses comes down and he confronts it. In fact, one of the things that needs to be done is that they are forced to look at the idol. I think that's what's going on in verse 19. I mean, it's kind of weird. Moses approached the camp, saw the calf and the dancing. His anger burned, and he threw the tablets out of his hand, breaking them to pieces, symbolizing the fact that God has his covenant with them, and it's been shattered. Not by the throwing of the stones, 
but by the building of the calf. And then he took the calf and burned it in the fire, ground it to powder, scattered it on the water, and made the Israelites drink it. One of the things that needs to happen a lot of the time to deal with an idol is we need to drink it. To be forced to really take into ourselves and into our minds and into our hearts. Wow. What is this thing? And I can't imagine that gold-laden water is yummy. You know, I, I don't think that's ever become a hip new drink. Starbucks doesn't have it. Sometimes God breaks the idol. Sometimes God lets the idol break you. But there has to be a point when somebody breaks the idol. And lastly, see, this doesn't solve the problem. And I know there's a lot of here, of this passage that we're kind of flying through. But Moses, after they've ground it to powder, they've drank it. He said to Aaron, what did they do to you that you led them into such great sin? And Aaron says, oh, it wasn't my fault. They just, I just did what they asked me to do. And I, I threw it in the fire and out came this calf. Does Aaron get it at this point? Clearly not. See, you don't have to just have to break the idol. We need to break idolatry in our lives. Because idols have deep root systems. Don't they? Kind of like a tree. If you cut down a healthy tree, or you run over it with a lawnmower when it's about this tall, it comes back. Because the root system is there. And if all we do, same thing true with thistles in your lawn, right? If you don't get the roots, they'll come back. How do you break it? Well, first of all, and I, I don't want to dig into this too much because there's way too much here. But God communicates that we have to take it seriously. I mean, he has them go through the camp and 3,000 people die. And I don't think that just happened by coincidence. I, I bet if you could go back, you'd say, wow, it's interesting how many of those people that died were the same people, the inner circle around Aaron. And then Moses says in, the, in verse 30, he offers himself as atonement. He says, God, don't kill your people. Don't destroy. Don't disown them. And he offers himself as atonement. He offers literally his own name to be blotted out of the book of life. He offers himself. And God does not accept that. Because honestly, we know enough about Moses to know that he had his own idols. That's where this passage points to Jesus. The perfect atonement. The one that can break the idols in our life, that can dig up the roots, can wrench them out painfully sometimes. But that's why we need Jesus. 
other people can point to our idols and poke at our idols and help us to deal with them. But ultimately, the one that can change our hearts is Jesus because he paid for that on the cross. Our idols are sin. I mean, they're the things that we grab onto. And Jesus on the cross paid for it all. There's a, a comment here that I haven't nailed yet. Uh, something about Jesus is the roundup that will kill the thistles in the lawn of your life. Doesn't really work, but it kind of does. So what? We have... Another thing we want to do this morning, so I need to wrap this up. I want to give you three quick applications. Number one, I want to challenge you to identify your idol. And this is an independent thing. It's an individual thing. What do you worship? Not just, I mean, not in a major, major way. Often, it's subtle, but what are the things that you trust to give you, you're like, I can't really have a happy, abundant, full life unless I have that. We have those, don't we? Number one, identify them. If, if you can't think of this, ask God. That's a scary prayer. God, poke my eye. Maybe you need to ask a few close friends. Maybe you need to just ask yourself. I don't like to ask myself that question. Identify your idols. Number two, place your trust in God. Don't ultimately count anything else as the solution to your idols. Take it to God. Say, God, you are the one that can take this out. And thirdly, let's agree to not polish each other's idols. What if we didn't enable each other? What if we decided, I'm not going to help you to worship this thing that will break your heart? That's what drug dealers do, right? I'm going to provide for you. I mean, I've, I've, I've seen documentaries. I've read things. I've heard things about there are drug dealers who think, really justify in their own mind, these people are hurting for heroin so badly by selling them heroin. I'm doing them a favor because I'm giving them the... The answer, that's called polishing another person's idol. And last thing I want to say here is, let's think about this um, as a church, Thorn Creek. 175th anniversary. Don't look back and give something else credit for what God has done. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the only thing we should hold on to ultimately. If we think, you know what, God, oh, the, the building here, that's what God has used that. Yeah, God has used that, but that's not the point. The building on Michigan Avenue 106th, 107th, 107th. That's not the point. If we give that thing credit, that's an idol. If we give our, <laughs> our seats, oh, you know what? I, this is where I sit. I sat here. My grandparents sat here. A hundred years ago in a different place, which is kind of a crazy thing to say. 
the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of people. If only our neighborhood, our community was like it was in the 40s or the 1890s. That, oh, that was, no. It's the gospel. If anything, our 175th anniversary should be a celebration of the gospel.